Welcome to the second video of the 15 Poems from Songs of Ourselves, Volume 1, Part 4. Today we're going to be looking at the poem The Bay by James K. Baxter. Well, I found this poem a real tough nut to crack. I still don't feel as though I have a certain understanding of the poem. I find that um, this poem is really, really open for your analysis and interpretation. You'll see why as I talk you through the analysis and interpretation in a moment. But first, let's just read this really fascinating poem. On the road to the bay was a lake of rushes, where we bathed at times and changed in the bamboos. Now it is rather to stand and say how many roads we take that lead to nowhere. The alley overgrown, no meaning now but loss. Not that veritable garden where everything comes easy. And by the bay itself were cliffs with carved names and a hut on the shore beside the Maori ovens. We raced boats from the banks of the Pumice Creek or swam in those autumnal shallows growing cold in amber water, riding the logs upstream and waiting for the Taniwa. So now I remember the bay and the little spiders on driftwood, so poisonous and quick. The carved cliffs and the great outcrying surf with currents round the rocks and the birds rising, a thousand times an hour is torn across and burned for the sake of going on living. But I remember the bay that never was, and stands like stone and cannot turn away. On the road to the bay was a lake of rushes. I understand that there is some kind of hint at a journey in this first line. Okay, and then we see the contrast of textures in nature. So this is a use of imagery. We're seeing a contrast in the hard road, the sort of gentle soft bay, uh, the water of the lake, perhaps um, the image of the sun reflecting off it, and the sort of hard bamboos that are very lightweight, uh, sort of plant that grows up like a tree. Um, so there's all these textures of nature, and you really get a feel for this location. Rushes is a use of homonym here. Um, of course, the verb to rush uh, sort of connotes freedom and excitement, perhaps childhood excitement. Uh, but rushes are also wild plants that grow in the water, in this case, in the lake. The poet talks about bathing in this lake and changing in the bamboos. Notice the past tense. There's some kind of childhood nostalgia. Uh, the poet is at one with nature here. Then the poet changes to present tense. He's jumping from thinking about the past to how he's feeling now. Now. It is rather to stand and say. So perhaps there is some kind of reality versus nostalgia theme emerging here. He says, it is rather to stand and say. There's an image of boldness, facing up to the realisation of something, a truth, an admittance of something. How many roads we take that lead to nowhere. The author has capitalised nowhere here to make it a proper noun, a place where we end up. It seems that we make decisions in life, we take different pathways and often we feel as though we're making progress and living a purposeful life but we end up nowhere, we end up back to where we started or unfulfilled. Perhaps this is a metaphor for the choices and decisions we make in life. Perhaps the alley that is overgrown is a metaphor for the depleting choices that are now available in old age. There seems to be some melancholy or sad tone created when the author talks about having no meaning, nothing but loss in his life. The veritable garden where everything comes easy is possibly a metaphor for childhood, similar to the first couple of lines where we are at one with nature. We don't think about our position as different to nature. 
we swim in the lake, we get changed in the bushes, we are free and experiencing nature in a more pure state. Some of the technical features that appear in stanza one include enjambement, contrast, homonyms, imagery, personification, metaphor, and tone. The metrical pattern and the rhyme scheme are presented in free verse, so there's not really a strict structure to the poem. This could be argued to mirror the childhood innocence and freedom that is being conveyed in stanza one. Very often you will find in poetry that the form comes to mirror the content of the poem. So in this case, the freedom that is being described is mirrored in the freedom of the rhyme scheme. Okay, so on to stanza two, where we see a shift in tone. And by the bay itself were cliffs with carved names. Notice the k, k sounds. This is an alliterative vela plosive which just means alliteration, the sound of k. Perhaps this is again form mirroring the environment. So the sounds of k and k could perhaps give a sort of rugged and harsh feel, similar to the landscape of cliffs. When we see the word names here at the end of the line, I interpret an ambiguity. I'm not sure if the author is talking about graffiti that young people may have carved their names in the wall, or if he's talking about Maori art. There are traces in this area of the indigenous people that lived here and have lived here for a very long time. The huts could be where the Maori people lived and worked before the European colonisation of New Zealand. Maori ovens are ovens that use stones and fire to create an underground heating space in the earth. I believe this is symbolic of the harmonious way the Maori people lived with nature in contrast to the modern European colonizers of New Zealand. Perhaps this is symbolic of a fading lost past. So as in the first stanza, we learned about the author lamenting the loss of his own childhood innocence and youthful freedom. Perhaps here, the author is also lamenting the loss of the Maori culture or the depletion of the Maori culture in this region. For me, this evokes sadness in the reader. The author then utilizes alliteration again, adding momentum to the racing children, creating an excited tone. So this is in contrast to the sadness that is evoked in the previous line. The author says, we raced boats from the banks of the Pumice Creek. Notice the momentum there of the sound of the line. Again, in my opinion, this is form mirroring content. So the sound of the words replicate the image of the racing boats. Pumice is a volcanic rock. So when a volcano erupts and lava rolls down the hill, when it dries very quickly, cools, it becomes pumice. Now, this is again just my interpretation. I'm not saying it's fact, but this could be symbolic of an extinction to mention that the creek was made out of this old volcanic lava. This could perhaps be alluding to his own childhood, where adulthood wipes out childhood, a bit like an erupting volcano, but it could also represent that the native people of New Zealand have been damaged and harmed by the European colonizers. In the following line, we see an example of sibilance, swimming in the shallows. And again, perhaps we've got this mirroring of the sound of swimming. In my opinion, at this point in the poem, the tone, the feeling, the mood starts to change. Autumn is here, summer has gone, a new era is beginning, a new phase of life. 
So this is a reference to the changing seasons, literally, but metaphorically it could be something to do with the changing civilizations in this land. As we grow, perhaps we are stripped of our naivety. So we grow, we grow older, we become adults, and we become colder. The author then brings in a reference to Maori mythology, the Taniwa. In the author's childhood days, when he used to play in this lake, racing boats, running around with his friends, they probably talked about the Taniwa, a bit like the Loch Ness Monster, or any other sort of sea creatures that you may have heard of from ancient mythology. It's important to note at this point that Baxter was an activist in preserving the Maori tradition. My interpretation is that the Taniwa here is embodied by the people that arrived on their boats and caused actually quite a lot of destruction to the Maori people in New Zealand. And I'll hope that I'll be able to argue that case a little bit more in stanza three. So, at the start of stanza three, Baxter writes, So now I remember the bay and the little spiders on driftwood, so poisonous and quick. Could this be metaphorically referring to the people who took this land from the Maori culture? Or is it just a memory of little poisonous spiders that he used to see when he was playing as a child? I don't know. This is another ambiguity, and it'll be up to you to make your decision and form your own interpretation, perhaps based on further reading and research. However, using my hypothesis that the spiders do represent a new civilization arriving on this land and depleting the previous civilization, that would be perhaps embodied in the adjective poisonous. Later, we have another example of that alliteration, and we see the surf, we see an outcry from the surf, the carved cliffs and the great outcrying surf. An outcry is a spontaneous, emotional, passionate declaration of disapproval. So here my hypothesis starts to take hold. We then see a very dark tone beginning to emerge. Currents are strong forces, dangerous forces, aggressive forces emerging from the ocean. There's then some imagery, uh, hard and rough textures emerge. So uh, the currents have got obviously this sort of aggressive and dangerous connotation. So the rocks there uh, reinforce these rough and hard textures similar to the carved cliffs beforehand. We see the birds rising, perhaps fleeing from something. There's an ominous tone here. There's some darkness on the horizon. And then we see the surf and the cliffs, which is being torn across a thousand times an hour and burned for the sake of going on living. Real imagery of destruction here in torn and burned. Perhaps Baxter is referring to the land that has been taken and destroyed so that a new civilization can go on living. Now, we're not really sure who he's talking about here. Who is going to go on living as a result of this tearing and burning, this great outcry that's happening? Who is going to go on living? Perhaps the new owners of this land, new generations? So I believe that there is a parallel meaning going on here. The first meaning is aging, loss of youth, nostalgia for the past, and facing old age, and the, the lack of choices that that possibly brings. The other meaning could be to do with a more macro time span. So like we age and change, grow old and die, civilizations do this on a wider scale. And then the final two lines, very ambiguous. I remember the bay that never was. Perhaps he's now reflecting on his interpretation of the bay when he was a child. And his view of the bay when he was a child is very different to his view of the bay now. Now he's gained more knowledge throughout his life. 
And at the end of the poem, the final line, he says, I stand like stone and cannot turn away. So we may interpret that as he's hit upon a sudden realisation of a truth, or perhaps that he is like the creek, like the cliffs, part of nature. He has become one with the land. I like the idea of the poetry portfolio because it's an opportunity for you to be creative and get your ideas down in a neat and concise way. I would recommend for every two page spread, which is what you can see in front of you on the screen, you would have the poem on the left hand side and your analysis on the right. So with 15 poems, you'll have 15 double page spreads, that's 30 pages in total. Stick the poem in the left hand side of the portfolio, annotating in detail. And on the right hand side, make notes about the story, the tone, the form and the message. Your portfolio might look a little bit like this, like a kind of scrapbook. Your annotations might look a little bit like this. You might want to come up with your own colour scheme. Perhaps your annotations will look a little bit like this. It's entirely up to you how you create your notes. Perhaps you want to use a computer and create a digital portfolio. That would also work. Well, hopefully those annotations will be useful for you. You might not agree with all of my interpretations. You might bring your own ideas to the table, and that's absolutely fine. In fact, that's essential really to doing well in this exam. Try to be creative with your portfolios, try to make them presentable and they should be a really good revision tool when it comes to the exam period. One essay question that I've tried to answer is how does Baxter use figurative language to help effectively convey a message? I have an introduction here to this essay and here is an example of a paragraph. So if you're wondering how to actually write about poetry this is an example for you. Follow the link beneath this video to find the 1000 word essay and the full lesson. I hope you've enjoyed this introduction to the poem. Hopefully it's been useful. Now watch out for that Taniwa.